Thank you all for joining us in worship today, virtually and in person on this homecoming Sunday. Woohoo! You're here on a great day. And it might not rain, but it probably will. <laughs> well, the wait is finally over, and the carnival is happening in the basement to avoid the rain that is probably going to happen. So I hope that each and every one of you will head downstairs right after worship today for games, prizes, walking tacos, popcorn, so much more. And right after worship, you might notice that this space right in front transforms a bit. And if you are feeling particularly strong and would like to see what it's like to move a pew out of the way, <laughs> you are welcome to stick around after worship and help just move a couple pews to make room for something. I won't say any more than that. Next Sunday after worship, you're all invited to stick around after church for a forum in the upper room with Pastor Steve. This will be a time to hear about the programming for the upcoming fall season and to hear from Pastor Steve in a non-sermon sort of way. <laughs> Would you like to become a member of First Church or learn more about the ministries of this church? You're invited to a membership exploration class and lunch with Pastor Steve on Sunday, September 25 at 11.15 in Wesley Hall. Go to grfumc.org slash news or to church center to let us know to expect you. We appreciate the many, many ways that each of us is involved in ministry at First Church and how you all financially support First Church. If you brought your offering today, offering plates and boxes are located at the entrances to the sanctuary. Or if you prefer to give electronically, go to grfumc.org slash give. The most efficient and cost-effective way to give to First Church is by using the electronic funds transfer. Those contributions use your checking or savings account to help reduce the cost of fees associated with credit cards. You can sign up for this electronic funds transfer giving on our website, or you can pick up a form located by the donation stations. Your tithes, offerings, and gifts are making a positive difference in this community and beyond. Before we transition into our prelude, please keep the following people in your prayers this week. Myra, Mason, Richard, Carla, Peggy, the Lane family, Alana, Betsy, Rick, Cami, Larry, Ashley, Pat, Jer, Carl, Amarina, and Connie. Please keep these friends in your prayers as we continue in worship and throughout the week.
Good morning. Good morning. I invite you to join with me in our call to worship. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. We will worship God, the one we love. Love your neighbor as yourself. We will open our hearts to all God's children. standing for our opening prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. God of love, you come to us in many ways. When our souls are bruised and weary, you come to us. When we are broken and destitute, in spirit or in flesh, you come to us. Heal us and care for us. Open our hearts to hear and receive. Open our minds to wonder and grow. Open our souls to embrace and be changed. Speak your healing word to us now, that we may be made whole by your grace and restored to our neighbor in love. This we pray in the words that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first reading is 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength because he considered me faithful. So he appointed me to ministry, even though I used to speak against him, attack his people, and I was proud. But I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and without faith. 
Our Lord's favor poured all over me along with the faithfulness and love that are in Christ Jesus. This saying is reliable and deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the biggest sinner of all. But this is why I was shown mercy, so that Christ Jesus could show his endless patience to me, first of all. So I'm an example for those who are going to believe in him for eternal life. Now to the king of the ages, to the immortal, invisible, and only God, may honor and glory be given to him forever and always. Amen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And now any children out there are welcome to join me up front for our children's moment. it makes my heart so happy to see a big long parade of kids coming down for this children's moment can I get an air high five from everybody ready one two three nice hey I wonder do you know your neighbors where you live do you know do you know your neighbors yes kind of who, raise your hand if you play with neighbors at your house. Play with neighbors, mm, kind of. <laughs> raise your hand if you have, like, adults who live next to you, and maybe not kids. Yeah, but you know who they are. Yeah, okay. I wonder, how do you be a neighbor? Have you ever thought about that before? You've probably heard the word neighbor. What does that mean? Hmm. I heard in our song that Jesus told a story about being a good neighbor. That's weird. It's like Jesus, there were neighbors back when Jesus was on the earth too. Huh. I'm not going to provide you with any answers today, but I encourage you to wonder about that and think about what it means to be a good neighbor. And maybe this week, you can keep your eyes and your ears out for what it looks like to be a good neighbor. Sound good? All right, let's say a prayer together, shall we? This is gonna be a standing prayer because I've lost half of you to the choice. Here, everyone stand up. Let's stand up. Look over this way. My children, especially, you too, uh-huh. Thank you. All right. Let's do, we'll do a whole body prayer. Let's put your, stretch your hands all the way up to the sky. God, thank you for the sky. God, thank you for the rain. Make your fingers rain. God, thank you for the soil. God, thank you for the plants. And thank you for me. Amen. All right, my friends. If you would like to come upstairs for children in worship, that's if you are in preschool, kindergarten, first grade, or second grade. Or if you are becoming a Bible explorer because you are in third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, or sixth grade, we're all going to go up the stairs in just a moment. And adults, parents, today, if you would kindly come pick your kids up by going out these doors to my left, up the ramp and through the double wood doors, and then be sure to head downstairs for the what? The what? That's right. See you then.
you say amen again to that? Amen. <laughs> well, good morning, church. It is good to be back with you this morning after some time off for rest and relaxation, and I'll put that in quotes as one of those things I was doing in these last few weeks was moving my son back up to school in Marquette, and we know how that can go sometimes, as I'm sure some of you were as well. But we're excited to be back after some rest and relaxation in this new season and as we begin a new sermon series called Neighbors and Ourselves. And we also acknowledge today the solemnity that we share on this 21st anniversary of 9-11, and of course, as the world learned this week of the death of Queen Elizabeth. But yet today is also a day of celebration for the future, and so just as Audrey was enthusiastically inviting all of you to come down for our carnival. I will do the same. And uh, just a reminder, especially for those parents who are there, bring your kids down. There's cotton candy and popcorn. We will appropriately sugar them up before you leave today. <laughs> but we do have a lot planned, and uh, it reminds me, this day always reminds me of something that a uh, parishioner of mine at a former church uh, commented a few years ago that you can just almost smell the bratwurst cooking on opening day, can't you? And that's why we're here today as well. So as we prepare to start this new series on this homecoming Sunday, I want to invite you to hear the words of Scripture with me from the 10th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, beginning with the 25th verse. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think? was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers. And he said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said back to him, go and do likewise. Let us pray. Well, holy God, as our prayers have been said and these words have now been read, may we open our hearts to hear what you would speak to us on this day. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When we talk about neighbors and who they are, I'm sure that many of us have all of our own unique experiences that come to mind about our neighbors. And Looking at that a little further, I found a few quotes about neighbors that I wanted to start us off with that you may or may not be able to identify with. Here's one definition of a neighbor. People who live near you who are never around when you need to borrow a power tool or jumper cables for your car, but who are everywhere when you are having an argument with your spouse. Benjamin Franklin was uh, quoted, perhaps anecdotally, but quoted nonetheless, of saying 
that we are to love thy neighbor, as the scriptures say, but don't pull down your hedge. Finally, and I think most importantly as it relates to us today, it was G.K. Chesterton who was quoted as saying that the Bible tells us to love our neighbors and also to love our enemies, probably because they are generally the same people. Now, on a more serious note, judging by your response, we can relate to some of those. Maybe not, hopefully not. But we can detect in all of those a somewhat cynical thread through our history of how we treat our neighbors. And that's exactly why we as the church must address this in the manner that Jesus did so that we can get beyond that cynicism and actually work towards building a greater sense of community in the world. And I would propose, who better than us to do so? And that's also why this passage regarding the story of the Good Samaritan is still relevant and hits close to home for us today because it's a question that we all ask. Who is my neighbor? Whether we are aware of that question or not, we are constantly asking that in our mind. And in this case, the lawyer was just being more blunt about it by saying it out loud. It's described in uh, the book that we will be looking at uh, starting in a couple of weeks, The Art of Neighboring, that the lawyer was trying to define their neighbor as someone that they could choose to care for, thereby excusing themselves from the call to know and to love all of our neighbors. And so Jesus sets up this scenario about someone who is presumed to be on the excused list of one who we do not have to count as our neighbor, the Samaritan, but he sets the scenario up of the Samaritan being a better neighbor than the ones who were actually the neighbors of the victim. Now, in the modern world, we can easily gloss over this story as one that we've all heard before in many forms. It's easy even for the church to gloss over this story as well and to tell the stories about the importance of all of us being a good Samaritan. But as I am prone to point out from time to time, this is the Bible. And nothing, in spite of what others might want to say, is ever that simple. This story is meant to shock the audience as well as to convict the listener who, much like the rest of us, might be thinking that same thing that prompted the lawyer to ask that question in the first place, who is my neighbor, as a matter of fact? See, there was no shock in the fact that there was a man who was laying on the side of the road who had been robbed. In fact, Attacks by robbers along the roadway were probably a common threat in those days. But the shock comes, as I said, in the one who passes by. And the one then who actually responds. One could even wonder how such a person who should know better would be even able to ask such a question. The scriptures clearly tell us, as he quotes from Leviticus and Deuteronomy, that we are to welcome the stranger and the foreigner in our land as one of us. We are to love them and we are to love our neighbors as ourselves, as Jesus pointed out earlier. And yet the question is asked anyway. But why do we ask it? Alex Shanks comments on this passage that it's actually easier for us to do that than we might think it is. In fact, we do it without thinking. And the danger for all of us, as we know now, is that we get so good at analyzing and rationalizing that we develop layers around our hearts. At that point, we give ourselves permission to close our eyes and to walk past somebody. Instead of a servant, he says, we become a spectator or a critic, an arm's length analyzer of all of the problems in the world. But Jesus tells this story as a way to help those who are unable to see or may just want to be critical of others. And in that, he exposes our weaknesses 
and us wanting to justify our own wants and desires above the needs of others. We, oftentimes seeking to divide, we are called and we are shown in our own way that we can expose what is different rather than looking for what unites us. We have a lot of divisions in this country right now. I'm sure I don't need to tell you as well as the divisions that we have in our world. But the challenge for us in the church is not to be outside observers and critics of the division, but to take the necessary steps and actions so that we can break down those barriers and we can set aside those divisions. It's actually quite easy to divide and to conquer, but that is not what the faith is all about. Conquering was never a part of Jesus' ministry. Faith is not meant to be a wedge that divides us, but instead it opens our eyes to see how God is uniting us. And the reality for Jesus' original audience is that they could not even conceive that somebody like a Samaritan was even capable of doing such a thing. The chief reason being is that they were taught from an early age on to fear and even to hate. And thereby, they refused then, out of this fear and hate, to know that they could be a neighbor. And that might be a little bit of our problem today. We don't really know each other. We think we do, but we really don't. And we don't know why people think and believe the way that they do. And while we have access today to a vast amount of people and personal connections through the internet and social media, we are actually more isolated than we have ever been. And we don't know our neighbors. The good news is, we can know them. And we can know who they are and what we are capable of accomplishing together rather than looking at what these divisions create in our own hearts. And so that is why we'll be spending time over these next several weeks to talk about what it means to love our neighbors and ourselves and to look at our study, The Art of Neighboring, because when we can know our neighbors, we really also get to know ourselves more fully. Now, we have probably heard that from time to time, somebody has that neighbor, so to speak. The one who is, well, shall we say, hard to love. Whether they play their music too loud, or they don't cover their trash bins, or cut their grass, or whatever uh, thing that they put out there that we just go, why would you even do that? If it's not that neighbor then, and you don't have that neighbor that doesn't respect those boundaries, not just of the hedges, as we have said, around our property, but of that space where we can let people in. Now, as a comedian also once said, my mom always said that there is one weird person on every bus, but I can never seem to find them. Yeah, think about that for a minute. So if any of those apply to you, then maybe you need to listen up a little more. <laughs> Seriously, we all have to work on being a better neighbor. And we can do so by making those personal interactions that are becoming fewer and far between. Gary Newhoff, who's a founder of uh, Connexus Church, recently wrote in his blog as to why he is changing his mind about the use of technology and social media in particular. Not that he is rejecting it outright, but because of what we have observed, especially over this last decade or so, about how our use of technology is changing us and not helping us to be good neighbors. And he says, we do live in a paradox in which attention spans are getting shorter but longer at the same time. So much of what passes as content on social media is mostly undigested thought. He says, a while ago while I was at a conference, I quoted a well-known author 
and then got some negative emails about even mentioning him. <clears throat> Excuse me, him. Rather than replying in writing, Gary says, I talked to the people in person about their concerns. And in the process, I asked them if they had ever read the author in question or listened to one of their talks. Guess what? They hadn't. He says, it's fascinating and a bit concerning to me that we live in an age in which people can hold passionate opinions about something they know almost nothing about. It's true. Sadly, this even can include our faith or lack thereof. If you push the ranting and the raving and the animated discussions that we have aside and probe a little deeper, Kerry says, many people are just three questions away from their worldview collapsing. Now his encounter is not exactly like the ones with the scribes and the religious lawyers that Jesus had, but it is similar. And now Jesus didn't ask three questions, but in telling the parable, he accomplished the same goal of collapsing this lawyer's worldview so that it could actually be opened up to a wider range of neighborly love than he ever thought possible. Being a neighbor is not just about being like me. It is about loving and genuinely caring for someone who, if nothing else, shares our own proximity, our own humanity, and our own createdness. Now, being a new neighbor myself, in a lot of ways, I'm also relearning a lot about what being a good neighbor is and the way that we relate to one another. And I'm also relearning again, based on some comments, that when people ask where we live, about those assumptions that we can all make without knowing who people are or who we are talking about. Friends, making assumptions helps no one build up the church and does not help any of us truly love our neighbors as ourselves. What I have had to relearn again is that being a good neighbor and loving them takes deliberate intention and takes work to truly to get to know one another. It's a process and a building of a relationship that takes time, but involves respecting boundaries that with that time and more interaction, those boundaries will be let down so that we can know each other more fully. I personally first met our new next door neighbor about a month after we had purchased our home, but had not yet moved in. And we were busy working inside most of the time, and the times that we were outside, they weren't at home. But when we had the opportunity to meet, we were welcomed. And we found out a little bit about each other, and right away, they offered to exchange phone numbers and to watch out for the house until we were more fully moved in. Now, they didn't do this because we held the same ideology. We didn't know that. We just met. They didn't do this because we uh, went to the same church. Obviously not. They didn't do this because of who we voted for in the last election. They did it because it is what we are called to do. To take care of one another and to help be one that builds community and raises everyone up. And so for that, we're personally grateful, but we also have a lesson to reciprocate that care as well. And couldn't we all use more neighborliness like that? Well, the Good Samaritan is about expanding our own view and confronting our own prejudices and prejudgments about people who are not like us and seeing neighbors as ourselves. It is also something to do with and something to say to us today about our immediate neighbors. The Samaritan, unlike the priest or the Levite, met the physical and the material and the financial and the emotional, emotional needs of the person who was on the path. But our neighbors are in our path 
on a daily basis. And one of the ways that I think we as the church can tone down the rhetoric of the day and the assumptions that we all make is to take the time to know our neighbors. Now that doesn't mean that we have to agree with all of our neighbors, but if we are intentional of listening and relating our shared experiences, sharing our stories, it becomes far more difficult to hate and it becomes that much easier to learn to love. Now Jesus, after having told this story, doesn't ask three questions, but again asks one question. Which of these three do you think was the neighbor? Now, the obvious answer, which cannot be escaped by now, was, of course, the one that showed mercy. And in being led to answer his own question, the lawyer then gives a command to this, or Jesus, I should say, gives a command to this lawyer to go and to do likewise. And we too, upon hearing this story, are called to do likewise in our own community and in our own world. We have to be intentional about loving our neighbors and ourselves. And at times, we have been. Especially when it comes, out, comes to reaching out to those who have been traditionally marginalized in our community and even in the church much like the Samaritan was marginalized in the community and by the religious authorities. It is our job to reach out and to share that all people are our neighbors as ourselves. And this can become easier to do, especially in this context here that we have created. And the challenge then for us is to continue to do so at home. Maybe we already are, and that's great. We should continue to encourage that. Maybe some of you have to work on this a little more, and this may be a good opportunity for all of us to build on what already exists and make it better. But for everyone, especially for those who need to take that next step, it can be an opportunity for us to break down barriers. Because when we create an attitude and an environment of loving our neighbors as ourselves, it can and it should become contagious. Professor Jamil Zaki at Stanford University put it this way in an article that he wrote a few years back in Scientific American that says, kindness itself is contagious. It can cascade across people, taking on new forms along the way. People will make larger charitable gifts when they believe others are also being generous. In situations where people can afford to donate, he said, it can inspire people in other positive ways. And he goes on to say that when we see other people acting more kind and generous and giving ways, we are all more inclined to act that way ourselves. We replicate this, and we can duplicate this, and we have the example of the one who showed the ultimate kindness and generosity in Jesus himself. Over these next few weeks, let us examine ourselves. Let's take a look at our own behaviors, but let us also then be intentional and be the example of recognizing who our neighbor is and what neighborly love is all about. Let us truly get to know our neighbors and to love them not as enemies, but to love them as we were truly loved first by God. And as the scripture says, when we love our neighbors, we can also love ourselves more fully and know that we are all fully loved by God in Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God for this gift of grace of being a neighbor. Amen.
join our hearts together in prayer. Gracious God, on this homecoming Sunday, we give you thanks for new beginnings, for the return to school, for the movement from summer into fall, and for the many ministries and activities of our church community. We ask for your blessing in all we say and do during this new season of our lives. This morning, as we celebrate together in worship, we're also mindful that today marks another anniversary of the tragedy on September 11th, 2001. We remember the many lives that were lost and pray for those who continue to live with grief. We also mourn the racism and xenophobia that continue to be fueled by this tragedy. We pray for an end to violence war and hatred, as we also grieve the many ways that we have not yet learned the things that lead to peace. Teach us, O oh God. As we remember and reflect, strengthen us with the assurance of your presence and of the hope that we have in Christ. Help us to become increasingly aware of our neighbors that we might better love them in word and action we pray this morning for those in our city who are struggling with affordable housing, with food insecurity and clean water. We pray for all those impacted by gun violence and other forms of violence in our city. We pray for those who mourn and for those who are sick and suffering. Give us compassion to join with you in comforting those in need and give us grace to share your love in all places. Stir within us a vision of your kingdom and a renewed desire to offer ourselves to the work of justice and peace, beginning in our neighborhood. Help us to extend your love to all people. We pray in the name of Jesus, whose love heals us, liberates us, and moves us forward with hope. Amen. Thank you.
now as we go from this place and from this time of worship, may we continue to hear the call of God to love our neighbors as ourselves. May we heed the call to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God as we continue to share in that good news, to be a good neighbor, and to build that peaceable kingdom in all the world. May we go in that grace and go in that peace. Amen. Thank you.